Hello, everyone. Good to see you. I'm Abby Pogrebin. And as some of you know, this is our capstone series for wonderful pairings for very tough questions. So our two incredible panelists tonight hail from different parts of the city. Rabbi Ami Hirsch is the senior rabbi of Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in New York, where he articulates a clear vision for the survival and success of American Judaism while tending compassionately to the needs of his growing congregation. He is the host of the bi-weekly podcast In These Times with Rabbi Ami Hirsch. It's a wonderful podcast if, you have, if it's not part of your podcast diet yet. And he's the author of The Lilac Tree and One People, Two Worlds co-written with Rabbi Yosef Reinman. Previously, Rabbi Hirsch served for 12 years as executive director of the Association of Reform Zionists of America, the Israel arm of the North American Reform Movement. Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum has served as the rabbi of Congregation Beit Simchat Torah, that's CBST, since its formation in 1992. She has been an active campaigner for human rights and civil marriage for LGBTQ couples. In 2021, President Biden appointed Rabbi Kleinbaum to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Additionally, she serves on New York City's Commission on Human Rights and lends her expertise to Mayor Eric Adams' Faith-Based Advisory Council. Rabbi Kleinbaum is also a member of the Executive Committee of Governor Hochul's Office of Faith and Nonprofit Development services, and just as a side note, she just celebrated her, we don't call it uh, retirement, we call it graduation or transition this week, so we give her a special applause. But Ami and Sharon, welcome. Come on out. Thank you. So who's teaching first? Yes, Sharon. So you, you have the podium, yes. Sorry to make you do a circle. That's quite all right. Well, I'm so uh, delighted to be here, and my basic rule in life is anything that Abby Pogrebin asked me to do, I do. And so I'm really thrilled to be here and to be part of this citywide learning project this year. And I've been very inspired by the various teachers, and it's an honor for me to be among them. And it's a thrill for me to be with Rabbi Ami Hirsch, who I've admired and uh, been a rabbi here in New York, in the New York rabbi world for all these years. And one small correction to your very generous introduction is that CBST, my synagogue, actually began in 1973, but did not have a rabbi until I came in 1992. So I was the first rabbi, but it was entirely lay-led for all those years. So tonight we're going to study a little bit about the Joseph story. Uh, that uh, Ami Hirsch and I are going to discuss some different elements of this story and see how that they speak to each other and what they bring out about our own lives today. So these chapters of the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshit, from chapter 37 to 50, form a discrete, uh, t uh, really, story of the entire arc of the telling of the story of Joseph. And so we consider these chapters from 37 to 50, the narrative that tells the story about Joseph. Interestingly, the Hebrew is very accessible. It's a very uh, well-told story that has these numbers of chapters to unfold, which is very unusual, actually, because many of the stories that we think of, of, the, of that the Bible gives us are actually very brief, and we've expanded them in the telling through our Midrash. But these chapters, 37 to 50, which brings us to the end of the book of Genesis, are very significant. They tell the story of Joseph from when he's 17 at the beginning of the story to his death at the very end. And in these chapters, we start to zero in on the very powerful family drama that any modern family can relate to. Obviously, the setting is very ancient and different, but the passion, the feelings, the damaging family systems, the struggle for reconciliation, the wounds that are left from previous generations that find themselves emerging in this story, we can all relate to in all different kinds of ways. 
So first of all, the book of Genesis in which these stories are told. Start, of course, with the creation of the world, Bereshit, bara, Elohim, et shamayim vieta aretz. The book of Genesis begins, God creates in the beginning the heavens and the earth. We are at a 35,000 foot zoomed out picture about the creation of the world. And the first couple of chapters of the book of Genesis are we could consider billions of years uh, told in the creation of the world. And slowly, the book of Genesis itself slows down and starts zeroing. We go from the creation of the world down to the creation of humanity. And then with the creation of Adam and Eve, we move to Cain and Abel, of course, and through the stories of Noah and then Abraham. And the book of Genesis slows down as the chapters pass. We go from the big creation of the world to the creation of humanity, to the creation of family systems. And it is remarkable that in our study of our ancient text, the primary stories are stories of families trying to figure out how to live together, how to respond to the hurts and the pains caused by the most close people in our lives. And the Joseph story is no exception. And it is the link of the story between the creation of the world, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Rebecca, Isaac, to the story that happens in the beginning of the book of Exodus of the slavery, the enslavement of the Jewish people, and then, of course, what happens next. But I want to focus briefly in my opening remarks on a way to read the Joseph story that might strike some of you as a bit unusual, but is actually in the Midrash itself. How do we understand the hatred between Joseph and Joseph's brothers? How do we understand a father that so clearly treats one child with preference over the other children? How do we understand Joseph who ends up becoming the primary power in the story that saves our people and the people in Egypt, of course? How do we understand this beginning of the story? So let's look at the text a little bit. In the beginning of the book, uh, the beginning of this chapter 37, this then is the line of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended to the flocks with his brothers and was like a youth to his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. Now Israel loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was the child of his old age and he made for him a striped tunic, a coat of many colors. So first of all, this sets up the, the drama that is about to unfold. So Joseph is 17 years old, so he's young, but let's be honest, in the biblical world, 17 is not that young. He's, people married at 13, 14, 15, but the way the story tells it, it's like he was a mama's boy, but of course his mom wasn't alive. He was his father's favorite child. And the word na'ar is used, he was like a youth. And many commentators ask, what does this mean? That he acted in certain ways that were very surprising. And the Midrash itself is surprised that Joseph is described of being like a youth. At 17, as I said, in these times, that was not so young. The rabbis of Genesis Rabbah, Breshit Rabbah, which is from around the fifth century of the Common Era, explains this complexity this way. He was 17 years old, but he was more like a youth. It means, however, that he behaved like a boy. And what does it mean he behaved like a boy according to Bereshit Rabbah? He did eyeliner on his eyes. He penciled his eyes. He used makeup on his eyes. He wore heels on his shoes and he curled his hair. This is a midrash from the fifth century that describes a teenage boy putting on makeup, wearing high heels, and curling his hair. And his father gives him a coat of many colors. So a friend of mine, uh, Rabbi Yoi Khan, who is a member of the CCAR and was the first rabbi of the Gay Synagogue of San Francisco, liked to say, this is an example of a biblical fairy tale. 
And we have to, as the LGBT Jewish world has emerged with power and strength, the ability to use hermeneutics that comes from reading this text and saying, hold on, liked to wear makeup, liked to wear high heels, and liked to curl his hair, and his father gave him a pretty coat. So for Yoi Khan, he describes an indoor kind of boy, and that's what made him his father's favorite child. His brothers, according to Yoi Khan's description of this, were the macho kind of field hands boy kind of boys. They were the ones who were hunting and gathering. They were macho and tough, and they were out in the woods, and a coat of many colors is not something that they would like. And in fact, in those days, and today too, in agricultural societies, no one who works a field wears a long coat, right? That's just wearing long coats was used by royalty to indicate they didn't have to work in the fields, right? They didn't have to do manual labor. You don't wear clothes like that. So in some ways, Joseph's father was honoring him for being a little, how shall we say, in a very anachronistic language, gender queer. Joseph did not fit in. And he certainly didn't fit in with his older macho brothers. And for, according to Rabbi Khan's reading, that helps to explain this tension between the brothers and the father and helps to explain it. So the question is, what of this striped tunic, this Ketonet Pasim, we don't really know how to translate it. Coat of Many Colors, of course, was great for the musical, but it's, it's hard to understand exactly what the words mean. And the way we understand biblical Hebrew best of all is to see how a word is used in another context. The only other time in the entire Tanakh that this phrase, Ketonet Pasim, or a, we don't, as I said, we don't really know how to translate it, is used is referring to King David's daughter, Tamar. And the text says in the book of 2 Sam, 2 Samuel, she was wearing a striped tunic, a ketonet pasim, however we want to translate that, for maiden princesses were customarily dressed in such garments. So the only other place in the entire Tanakh where ketonet pasim is used, we're being told that princesses wore this as a special garment. So surely Joseph understood that this was a garment related to royalty, first of all, and secondly, to girl royalty, to effeminate royalty. And he was wearing this, which went along with the rest of what Midrash describes to us, hair that he would curl, makeup that he would put on, and uh, high heels that he would wear. So Jacob gave Joseph a princess dress, which it seems, according to the text, he wore quite happily. So while we don't totally understand exactly what it meant to Joseph, that's what Midrash is, we're trying to. Now one other piece I wanna leave you with to encourage my, this interpretation of the text, and of course, every time we do this, we're trying to promote a perspective is how Joseph's appearance is described by the text, which is another sing signal. So uh, the other place where the same phrase is used about Rachel, Rachel, it, we're told in the text that Rachel haita yifat toar yifat maret, that Rachel was shapely and beautiful is the traditional JPS translation. And uh, it's used for Esther, v'hana'ara yifat to'ar v'tovat mar'eh. The maiden, referring to Esther, was shapely and beautiful. And the only other time it's used uh, was again in the same place about the, uh, about the, the princess. The woman was v'ha'isha tovat seichel. The woman was smart, v'yifat to'ar, and had beautiful looks or looked beautiful. Okay, now that you've heard those three references, the only time they're used in the Bible is to refer to these three women. How is Joseph described? Vayihi Yosef Yefeh To'ar, the masculine form, but the exact same language. Vayifeh Mareh, he was pretty to look at. He was beautiful to look at. He had a beautiful image. The same language is used. 
So Esther has a good appearance, while Rachel and Joseph have a pretty appearance. Joseph is described in the exact same terms that Rachel is. And finally, what happens, and we're gonna move forward in the text, when Joseph ends up in Egypt and Potiphar's wife comes on to him. Remember, that's part of the story. Potiphar's wife starts trying to seduce Joseph. And traditionally, our tradition talks about Joseph's great moral attributes as resisting her charms. But Rabbi Yoi Khan adds this to the fairy tale telling of the story of Joseph, that maybe he just wasn't that attracted to women, and it wasn't such a hard thing to resist her charms. Now, of course, we know that Joseph ultimately married, and, but it does turn out that there are other evidence that he didn't have a tremendous interest in the ladies. Now, of course, he could have been bisexual. We're not arguing about whether what in these modern terms. But we see in the character of Joseph such an interestingly turned on the head gender interpretation of what maleness and masculinity is. We have another story that after he was released from enslavement and rose the ranks of Egyptian society, here's a quote from Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, another <coughs> midrash really, when he was riding in the chariot and passed through the borders of the land of Egypt, the Egyptian girls were climbing up the walls for him and they threw to him rings of gold so that perchance he might look at them and they could see the beauty of his figure. But nobody's eye, <coughs> excuse me, degraded him. That is to say, he didn't look at any of them and was not drawn to them. So, of course, he did ultimately marry a woman, the Egyptian, chosen to wear fabulous clothing, our boy Joseph, rejected by his family, kicked out, sent to prison for refusing sexual advances, <coughs> and he loses his family. For my community, this is not a story that feels very distant. So many people in the LGBT world have been rejected by their families, like Joseph was by his brother, even hated by his brother for challenging concepts of masculinity and identity and being loved in a special way by a particular parent. So the question then becomes, what happens next? How does a family that is so destroyed, the father, the children, the other children are disappointed in their father's preference for one of their siblings. The sons feel like their acts of hunting and gathering and making sure there's food on the table are not appreciated. And Joseph is an obnoxious 17 year old. And while he has these dreams that actually have truth to them, what is his role? He's not only a victim in this story, he's obnoxious and arrogant towards his brothers and tells them that one day they will bow down to him. So there's a dynamic here Nobody is purely a victim, and nobody in this family system is purely a perpetrator. There is a deep dynamic that rolls itself out and ends up with Joseph in a pit, his brothers wanting to kill him, one brother saving him, but he gets sent down to Egypt as a slave. Thank you. Wow. I'll stop there. And we'll Um, first of all, uh, to Rabbi uh, Kleinman, I uh, just want to add my congratulations for a, just a magnificent career. And uh, what she's done over there at uh, CBST is just awesome, amazing. We kind of started our careers uh, together, uh, and uh, I've been a fan of hers uh, for uh, ever since, actually. Um, and Abigail, of course, uh, Frankly, anything that Abby does is high quality, and what Rabbi, Klein, uh, uh, what Rabbi Kleinbaum said about uh, Abby, that, you know, if she asks, you don't really, those who know Abby, you know, they, you don't really have a choice. If she asks, you do, uh, but it's an honor to be asked by Abby because you know that you've actually reached a high standard if she asks to talk to you or to interview or to invite you to some kind of... Uh, some kind of event, so. 
<laughs> uh, so let me just, uh, I'll just give a broad uh, overview. You need, you're going to need to stop me uh, when it's time to stop because I could go on here for a, a long time. So I'm going to try and just uh, give uh, an overview. Uh, Rabbi Kleinbaum talked about um, the arc of the book of Genesis. So really, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis talk about universal history, as she mentioned, and then thereafter, and for the entire duration of the Bible, the entire Tanakh, it focuses on one family and the descendants of that family. And we know that the parameters of the book of Genesis, in a sense, Genesis, the purpose of the book of Genesis is to tell you how the master narrative of Judaism came to be. The master narrative of Judaism being the exodus and the liberation. And so we need to, we need to figure out and we need to know about how it came to be that this family ended up in Egypt so that it then became a people, was enslaved, and uh, eventually was redeemed. And we know that because we're all, we all read these passages many times, right? We're scholars of the Bible. We know. And we read in Genesis 15, when Abraham covenants with God in a passage called Brit Ben Abitarim, the covenant of the pieces. We read in the book of Genesis, in Genesis 15, know well that your offspring shall be enslaved in Egypt for 400, in a land not theirs for 400 years, but I will redeem them with an outstretched arm and they will go and go forth with great wealth. Okay, so we know already in Genesis 15, right after the selection of Abraham, we know that at the end of this story, there's gotta be the family has to get to, to, to a land not theirs, in other words, Egypt. We know that because we've lived a long time and we know that slavery is part of the uh, equation. What we don't know is how is that all going to happen? But so beginning in Genesis 15, this whole drama, this whole book of Genesis has to lead at the end of the day to uh, the enslavement of the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham. That's theological bracket number one. Theological bracket number two happens actually in Genesis 45, which describes, Rabbi Kleinbaum talked about the chapter that deals with the strife between the uh, brothers. The, the, the title of this is Strife and Reconciliation, right? So Genesis 44 and 45 deal with the reconciliation part. Unless the reconciliation happens, the family can't get together. And if the family can't get together, they can't be saved from the famine that is imposed on the family. And um, the story of the people of uh, Abraham will die right there. So there has to be a reconciliation. And the reconciliation is marked by, and we read this, it's a beautiful passage, which we're not going to have time to go through now, but I urge you to read it, Genesis 44 and 45. It is m one of the most remarkable pieces of literature ever in human history. But we read in, 40, in chapter 45, if you're going to read it later, verse 7 and 8, where uh, Joseph, uh, he breaks down, he weeps, he empties the room, and he reveals his identity. And he says to the brothers, it was God who sent me here before you. So this Joseph, who had never really thought about God, except we, we don't really have any episodes of divine revelation. These are families who are, who are uh, behaving as families do, as Rabbi Kleinbaum mentioned. Um, but um, at the end of the day, when the reconciliation occurs, Joseph understands that the story of the family that is filled with such emotion is in fact connected to the broader destiny of the family that will become a nation. And he says to the brothers, it wasn't you who sent me here, even though it was them, right, on one level. But God who sent me here to save life. So at the end of this, at the beginning we read that there's going to be an, uh, an enslavement. That, the vehicle of that is Joseph. And when Joseph finally says to the brothers, he comes to the recognition himself, this is all part of the divine plan. 
This was God's way of getting us here to save life because otherwise they would all die through the famine. This is in a sense is brackets the entire um, story of uh, Genesis. So uh, in a sense, Genesis could be seen as prologue that gives us an understanding of how the master narrative of Judaism came to be and how it unfolds. It happened because these people, this family, with their pettiness and their strife and their uh, hostility and, and let's kill the boy, no, f- let's uh, throw him into the pit and let's sell him into slavery. And, but either way, we've gotten rid of him. All of these petty little dynamics that happen in family from the book of Genesis, we understand there's a broader theological purpose to this. It is the founding and the survival of our people. Uh, and uh, and we, we, we read that through all of these family stories that every one of us can identify with. So this teaches us that our lives and our, poten- our lives also have potential that go beyond the day-to-day existence of our relationships, that we never know what we might do, whether it's in the sense of strife or reconciliation, that in the end serves some kind of broader purpose, serves some kind of divine purpose. And that's really, that's really the, the kind of genius of this whole story of, of, uh, of uh, Joseph and, uh, and his brothers. We have little hints of, you know, what we have is therefore, and this was a huge discussion in rabbinical literature to this day. So the destiny of the people was to get down to Egypt. That had to happen. We read about it. Every time we read this passage again in Genesis 15, we read it again. There's going to be an exodus, and everybody knows that, because anybody who knows anything about Judaism knows that there's an exodus. Right? We had Passover not, not too long ago, and you know that. You read it. Um, so, uh, but, so we know it's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to happen. And that it happens in this way creates in Jewish um, uh, post-biblical literature a huge discussion and debate on the relationship between preordination God is omnipotent and omniscient and has decreed that there is going to be an exodus and enslavement. Uh, but all of this happens presumably through the exercise of free will. The brothers didn't need to hate uh, their younger brother. They didn't need to throw him in a pit. They didn't need to sell him to uh, the uh, Ishmaelites and then the Midianites. They, you know, they could have continued to search for him. After all, they didn't kill him. They simply sold him into slavery. Every act that they take presumably is an act of free will. And yet, it's all predetermined. We know that because those are the theological parameters of uh, the book of Genesis. By the way, just to show you kind of what, what, um, what are the kind of things that, uh, that the little, little tiny things that, determine the, that could determine the destiny of a family or a nation. So uh, Rabbi Kleinbaum mentioned uh, ketonet pasim, you know, the coat, we don't know how to translate that. Something like the coat of many colors or some kind of striped thing. Or, so the Talmud asked, what is that? What is the, this ketonet pasim? And uh, one school of thought believed that it was a, sh- a shirt, a silk shirt. Um, and then, of course, you know, the rabbis, uh, not, they're not satisfied with simply that. They need to ask additional questions. So they asked, uh, what was the shirt worth? How much was it worth? So they said, four shekels. Um, and scholars tell us four shekels. You know, they sold, if you remember, they sold Joseph into slavery for 20 shekels, which scholars tell us was not a lot of money in antiquity. So four shekels was almost nothing. So they conclude, and think about this, for four shekels, the people were enslaved. Had it not been for the jealousy that was created through, by the way, through Jacob favoring his son, 
the son of the most beloved of the wives, Rachel, who is dead now. Um, and that's part of the deal, too. That's what Rabbi Kleinbaum was really beautifully pointing out. Uh, in a sense, Joseph was kind of a substitute for Rachel. Um, and he, Jacob, um, created the circumstances where he even had a resemblance to Rachel. And that's the other thing, some of the Midrash that talks about whenever, whenever Joseph passed Jacob, Jacob thought he was looking at Rachel, right? His beloved uh, wife who died in childbirth. So um, just to uh, very briefly, and stop me, really stop me, but um, if you need, okay, five minutes. Um, some issues about, so Rabbi Kleinbaum talked about the strife part, that's in Genesis 37, you should read that too, that is a, just a masterpiece. You should read the whole thing, 14 chapters, read it carefully, take notes. It, just on a literary basis, it's beautiful literature. Um, so, so uh, to suggest to you, maybe we can talk about this in the discussion, to suggest to you some, some, um, some things as you read these passages, 44 and 45, which is the reconciliation part, which is the critical part. It has to happen. If it doesn't happen, there's, we're not around. It's all gone. Um, one, why didn't Joseph ever contact his father? Have you thought about that? Uh, we're not actually asking for answers here, right, because we're online and they can't hear the, okay. But, uh, so, so I, just to point out some of the tension, he, after all, he was the favorite child. His father, his father spoiled him. Now, one can understand that he didn't contact his father while he was a slave or a prisoner, okay? But he became the second in command of all Egypt. Why didn't he contact his father? Maybe he didn't care. Maybe he was angry. Um, he, he names uh, one of his sons Menashe, which means this son caused me to forget. Okay, it's kind of like, yeah, if you call your son, he, you cause me to forget, then every time you name the son, you're going to remember, right? That's kind of the inside joke. Uh, and the other son, Ephraim, it means uh, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. In other words, he's become, uh, he's become an Egyptian, especially when he rises to the second most powerful figure in all of Egypt, which is the superpower of the ancient world. Um, and remember, he, he doesn't know anything after the pit. He knows his father sent him, and it's kind of like randomly, out of the blue. You read it in chapter 37. Out of the blue, his father says, go find your brothers and tell me how they're doing. Something like that. And um, maybe Joseph thinks his father was in on the deal. Set it up. Why would he ask him to go and uh, see his brothers? Um, and bring back word for me. So Joseph, it's possible that Joseph is just simply still bitter and angry and never contacted. It wouldn't have been difficult. You know, it, like, okay, it's a, let's say it's a 40-day, probably less, it's probably around a 20-day march through the desert. You know, but, uh, he never called home, he never Facebook, texted, nothing. Um, and uh, that was one of the impediments to reconciliation, that if he was angry and bitter still after all these years, and he names one of his sons, darn it, and the other son, I feel great here. Okay, then there's no possibility of reconciliation. Two, why didn't he, one other possi another possibility. Oh, so um, that's one question. A second, there are lots of other possibilities, by the way, why he never contacted his uh, family. Two, why didn't the brothers recognize Joseph? Why didn't the brothers recognize him? I'll give you uh, some uh, suggestions uh, from the commentaries that uh, why would they recognize him? First of all, they'd become a, completely an Egyptian. He was an Egyptian lord, and he looked like an Egyptian. He probably shaved his head, and he had all the garbs, and he was royalty. Um, and in any case, why would they even think about their brother? They, for, the, for all they know, he was gone. They, they, the expectation that they would see him on the throne of Egypt was nonsensical. Three, um, why this kind of behavior on the part of Joseph towards his brothers? 
And we're not going to go through this in detail, but you know the story, right? He, he, he accuses them of uh, spying. He sends them back. He puts a goblet in. He sends them back. And so now he's got them. And he's saying, you guys go back. Keep, the, keep Benjamin here. Benjamin is the only full brother of Joseph and the only other son of the beloved mother, wife, Rachel. So what's happening here is and this, I, I guess I'll end with this. Um, the, what, what, what Nachmanides points out, Ramban, one of the great medieval commentators, is Joseph needed to create the environment, the setting, and the circumstances for true atonement. True atonement is if you are faced with the same circumstances of the original violation, and you do the right thing this time instead of the wrong thing, then you've atoned. And unless there's true atonement, there can't be reconciliation. Right? I mean, we, we know that from our own personal lives as well. So um, Joseph creates the circumstances where, again, the brothers can go home. The father is not going to know what happened to his beloved son, Benjamin. Um, remember, they told him when they came back, this is in chapter 37, they show him this, uh, the, the, the coat, and they say, filled with blood, and they say, the, this is what happened to your brother. We found this. This is what's, what happened. The wild beast uh, ate him, and uh, presumably that's what Jacob believed, although the text is much more complicated than that. Uh, but in this case, it's the same circumstance. They could very easily abandon their younger brother, Go back home, tell Jacob, this crazy uh, Egyptian uh, lord, he gave us food, but only on condition that we keep our uh, younger brother there. Nobody would have known the difference. It's because the brothers, uh, basically uh, Judah gets up and delivers this magnificent speech, but uh, it's because they, um, they refuse to abandon their younger brother that, um, that, that in fact, Joseph, that is what brings Joseph to the recognition that all of this is part of a greater plan and we can now reconcile uh, with the family. And that reconciliation then opens the door to survival, uh, but first 400 years of slavery. Amazing. Okay, that's a lot. Really incredible. I also just love that you went so deep on this story and have only begun to scratch the surface. I just want to start with strife. Like, what caused it? It feels like we're hearing, you know, a bunch of things, and we can extrapolate to our own lives, but the favoritism problem is, do the commentators or do the rabbis, capital R, feel like there's any culpability on Joseph's part? Sharon, do you want to talk about that? Well, I think the piece that Joseph carries is a bit of what I mentioned, which was he was obnoxious. I mean, he was really cruel to his siblings. Taunting them. Taunting them. And Strong. again, he might have been right, but the way he did it was, you know, a classic youngest child's taunting of older children, kind of, I am a youngest child, so I kind of relate to it because... You know, I knew if I got my brother to, uh, you know, hit me or do something bad, he'd get into trouble. I would never get into trouble, no matter how much I was actually the provocateur, which youngest children often are. I don't know anybody else knows that experience. I was that kind of kid, but because I was the youngest by a bunch of years, I always looked more innocent. And Joseph has a bit of that in his relationship with his siblings. So I think Joseph has the culpability of being, uh, uh, not really appreciating and being thoughtful about how his words would impact on these siblings. And then you look at the pattern of the families that preceded this, right? We've got a whole series of, you know, the Bible is not a great parenting manual. Let's just face it. I mean. <laughs> And one can say family trauma gets passed on. I mean, look at how the different parents before, uh, starting with Abraham and his sons, there's a lot to be said about not great parenting there. 
and then Isaac is silenced for the rest of his life, Ishmael, etc., going down to Jacob. Not a great story there. So I think there's a lot of culpability around, and this is where, in, where, where I relate to it a lot in thinking about it as a modern story or a story that can speak to us as modern people, is this issue nobody is completely a victim and nobody's completely a perpetrator in family systems. And we, in our psychologically oriented world today, certainly understand that using that kind of language. But I think the religious language that Rabbi Hirsch uses is very powerful. This is a setup for a bigger story as well. But I think, so I think Yosef, Joseph's culpability is in the way he, as a youngest child can, with the arrogance of youth, be extremely critical and taunting of his siblings. And before we go to Ami on this, I just also want to ask, because I've heard you talk about the fairy tale before, and you know, it's really substantiated with text, yeah. and which, as you know, I mean, many, I'm sure, would say, where are you getting this from? Yeah. It's, it's kind of in a lot of places. But I guess I'm just curious, do you ever get uh, skeptics or people feeling like it's sacrilege to even suggest that Joseph was getting... Well, I'm using the Midrash. I mean, the Midrash from the fifth century talks about him wearing the eyeliner, the high heels. And would and they the say curly. that was just the time? That's kind well, of Well, I think they would doing? say he was effeminate. I don't think they were uncomfortable with that. And the rabbis of the Talmud discuss various, um, uh, they use different Greek terms to talk about people who don't fit into strict gender binaries. So I think they, uh, there was a, an understanding of a world that existed in which there were some differences. Mm. It wasn't a contemporary understanding of a sexuality and an identity, but it was understanding that people didn't all fit into one idea of what masculinity or femininity looked like. Ami, um, just on the, is it Joseph's fault, in a sense? Um, maybe that's, that's not, it's unfair to blame the victim, but it feels like he sort of invited some of the animosity. He definitely invited some of the animosity. Look, first of all, he has these dreams. Right? By the way, dreams are another, it's another biblical technique to suggest to you that there's something happening beyond what you see on the day to day. People make a living to this day on interpreting dreams, right? And that there's some higher explanation or deeper explanation. Um, in, uh, in fact, uh, the Talmud says dreams are 1 60th of prophecy. So they have a kernel of eternal truth, but a lot of it is nonsense too. And the people who make a lot of money interpreting dreams, or in Joseph's case, acquire status and prestige and power, they, uh, they can sift through the difference between what's real and what's nonsense. Uh, but so he has these dreams. Okay, he's got the dreams. Dreams are, are good things in the, in the Bible, and, there's, and they're good things today. They're valuable, kind of. Like, they, they have currency. They, they imply vision, higher vision. I have a dream mm -hmm. that my four little kids will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Right? And, and, uh, and they, they, they um, say, well, here comes the dreamer. They say it in a derogatory way because... It's the dreams. We know this in, uh, when he gets down to Egypt as well, and he's pulled out from prison to interpret Pharaoh's dreams because Pharaoh is incapable of, and his advisors are incapable of doing it. And um, he, he's ha he has, he's gifted with this special insight, what we might call today emotional intelligence. Okay? But when he was 17 years old, okay, he had the dreams. So that's an indication to us that God is kind of pushing events in the direction of Joseph. But he tells his brothers, not only do I have dreams and do I have dreams about you, but let me tell you what those dreams are. And those dreams are basically, you're all going to bow down to me. And the reason, here's another piece of evidence of how we know that all of this is preordained. They eventually bow down to him. That's exactly what happens. So I, I, I would, one of the things that I think is so challenging to us in the modern times that I think 
our, the entire Tanakh handles quite differently and Jewish tradition handles it, is the issue of blaming the victim. Mm. Like that is instinctively in our modern language a bad thing. In Jewish thought, there is a sense that part of our jobs is to think about what ways we have contributed to the suffering in our lives. I mean, the, we're in the middle of the Omer period and one of the th stories that's told, historical stories about the Omer is that 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died from a plague during the, during the Omer period. That's one of the reasons we have the mourning uh, overlay to the Omer period. And the rabbis are quick to say, well, why did they die from the plague? They died from the plague because they didn't respect each other. Like, so there's always every prophet, Jeremiah, Amos, Isaiah, they talk about the Babylonians, the Romans, but they're, they're agents of God's will. They're, you'll, Isaiah never says, well, it's the, the other guys on the other side, they're the bad ones, we're the good ones. Isaiah says, we're suffering because we have to improve the way we live our lives. And so in this story, and I think throughout the Bible, asking in what ways we've contributed is not removing all agency or blaming the victim in only the modern sense. It's saying, if we have agency, we can actually do something. We're not only victims, but that's the, precisely the point. Joseph is not just a victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Ami has said, he understands there's a role he's playing and ultimately, this is the beaut part of the beauty of the story for me is how Joseph as an older person looks back on his life and understands things that every single person in this room can talk about your own lives, I know, which is we can look back on some of the terrible things we've lived through and from the perspective of years and age and maybe a little wisdom, appreciate that the suffering we went through helped to create maybe some of the best pieces of who we are. And when you're going through it, you cannot appreciate that. And you often only feel a victim. And it takes a kind of a maturity to look back and say, wow, now I understand. Not that I would wish anybody to go through pain in order to get to character development. But I look back on my life and I can appreciate that suffering helped to make me who I am. And the who I am. Uh, was essential to living out the life I ended up having. And how do we let go of the expect expectations of the life we thought we were gonna have in order to make room for the life we actually have is what Joseph's story is about. He gets to the point of understanding that he was destined and he was necessary for him to get to this place and the suffering he went through served a purpose. And as Viktor Frankl says, if we can give meaning to our suffering, uh, we can find ways to live full lives, no matter the degree of that suffering. You know, I, I have a friend who had a, a real tragic loss, and she often says, this wasn't my script, this wasn't my script, but I see what she has done despite it, or in spite of it, and it, there is this sense, again, like, not that, you know, the, because of this, like, not that God doesn't give us anything we can't handle, I think that's awful, but a sense, and you were hitting on it, Ami, that there is a plan of some kind, and maybe it's not a plan we would have chosen, but it gives me some sense of kind of trying to be in those hardest moments and saying, there's gotta be something that comes out of this. Not that there's a point to what's hard, but I wanna get at a little bit of the sense of the difference between free will and predetermination, because so much in this story, you're kinda like, really? Did God have to put Joseph through all of that? to get to him being the person that was gonna save us. It, it, it feels somewhat gratuitous. It feels like almost for the sake of the story or for the sake of God proving his power or her power, uh, God's power. You know, why so many paces to get to the outcome, as you said, that we needed? So there's this really interesting uh, balance and interplay between um, what was destined to be. By the way, that's, that's the other aspect of what you were just talking about, that, that it, it encourages us, these, these uh, passages from the Bible encourage us to see our lives not simply as lives in and of themselves, but part of a bigger narrative, a greater arc. 
if, you, if you're a religious person, that God has a plan for me, okay? But if you're not a religious person, that still, I wanna, I wanna make a difference, I wanna leave something behind. I didn't appear out of nowhere. I'm the next link in a long chain of history of our civilization or our culture or uh, however you see it. So it, it, it injects higher significance to our lives and therefore greater ramifications to the decisions and to the actions of our lives than, uh, than what we would otherwise just simply uh, accept as, okay, we're born, we live, we die, and that's it, and then, and then um, nothing, right? Um, but uh, does, does Joseph have to go through all this? So, you know, there's a, there's a whole library full of discussion in rabbinic literature about this this interplay between free will and, uh, and uh, predetermination. And the issue is profound. It's a religiously profound question because it maybe is one of the central questions in religion. Because if God is omnipotent and omniscient, God knows everything and God has all power. Why put people through suffering? As uh, our colleague wrote, why do, why, do, why, does bad thing, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? Um, or completely innocent people. Why does an infant uh, die uh, of a disease? Um, and so that's one of the central questions of uh, religion and nothing, it's really an unsolvable dilemma because if God, if you believe in that God, all-knowing and all-powerful, then God intervenes and can intervene in human affairs as, and doesn't. So either God is not all-powerful or is not just, right? Um, Can I just ask, I mean, do, just personally, do you believe in that God that is kind of moving pieces on the chessboard? Depends on what day and what mood you find me, right? I would like to believe that not only does my life have a greater purpose, but that I have some sort of destiny, and because I'm a believer, of course I connect that to God. But I read, I read something really fascinating. So there's no, there's no, no, no religion has really solved this. Uh, I think the best, the most persuasive interpretation for me in Judaism is um, that, is this, this concept of tzimtzum, right? From uh, the, the mystical concept. That if, if human beings have free will, which is the essence of morality, if somebody doesn't ha exercise free will, then the outcome might be bad. You know, if you, if, you, if you had some kind of seizure while driving a car, and you never had something like that before, and you get into an accident and you harm somebody, the outcome of that might be sad, even tragic, but it's not immoral, there's no moral ramification to that. There's only a moral judgment if you have the freedom to choose between the right way and the wrong way. And that's God's purpose, for us to um, usher in better generations, generation after generation, right? But it doesn't have to happen, so God has to withdraw and allow us to exercise our free will, even if what we decide is the wrong way. I just end with this. I, uh, I, I remember reading, uh, have, have any of you read uh, William James, the, the Will to Believe? That's a good book too. You should read that after you read the 14 chapters in Genesis. And uh, so he, he talks about uh, free will and preordination. And, and he says, it was an interesting image for me. So you make of it as you, whatever you want. But he said, um, look at it like this. It's, 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 a, it's akin to an amateur in chess playing a grandmaster. The outcome of this match is predetermined. We know who's going to win the match. We don't know all of the steps to the end of the match. Those are subject to your own decisions. But what's the end of the match? In, in, in terms of... The broader narrative. In, in, so, in your life and in the life yeah. right now, what's the right. end of the match? Is it, right. Do you imagine that's predetermined? I don't know. Okay. I, what about if you, you catch me on, on a moment. You? I don't believe in predetermination. And I, do, I believe, for me, God uh, is, a, I, I believe in God, but I don't believe in a God that cares so much whether I believe in God. 
Like that's my, and I, I feel like God gives us the ability and accompanies us in our sadness and in the suffering. And I, and I believe that God wants us to be uh, functioning on a, the highest possible level all the time and gives us all different motivations to do that including the ability when we are able to look back on our lives and see purpose and meaning, even if we couldn't get there while we were going through some things. And that's where I find God's presence. Uh, I, I'm reminded, I'm not a scientist, but there's a concept in science that I like a lot only because I read it in a novel. I, I really can't read, I can't do science, called the Doppler effect. Do we have any scientists here? You know what the Doppler effect is? that in physics, if you're standing on a train station, the train that is approaching the station appears um, uh, to be faster than the train leaving the station, even if it's exactly the same speed. That when we're looking back on our lives, it's a different, uh, and Wallace Stevens uses it in one of his books, that he talks about we live with the Doppler effect in life, that we're looking ahead at our life, it looks very fast and uh, it's a different thing when we're looking back on our life. And I think God is present as we try to make meaning out of the things that are happening. You mentioned that many in your community would not look at the Joseph story as some kind of remote, distant right. parable. And I have interviewed many. I did a, a piece for Tablet Magazine on LGBTQ identifying yeah. Jews. And that was such a theme of being outside. And especially, not just in the, their literal family, but in the Jewish family. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot has changed, but I just want to follow up on that a little bit in light of the Joseph story. Um, this sense of no matter how overtly or supposedly welcoming we are, and even as tiny a people as we are, that there are sort of norms and tents that you're in or you're outside. Can you just address that in terms well, of Well, look, the world we're in right now is a world that is increasingly hostile to LGBT people. It's not even, so even if one's personal family or is one's small community is accepting, or you've created an accepting community. Right now, the experience for most LGBT Jews, even in a place like New York City, is watching this country become increasingly hostile, and the world becoming increasingly hostile, and religion being used as the way to promote that. Um, and uh, that's terrifying. So, so it's also a metaphor, <laughs> you know, the story becomes a metaphor for the larger human community. So there are many, many, many uh, steps forward, of course. Uh, if you think it's forward, I do, and I think it is uh, fulfilling God's uh, uh, image. But at the same time, we're in, the, we're in a moment in life of a global rising authoritarianism, which has several themes that are repeated in almost every global context, in every national context that it's seen. Anti-immigrant, anti-LGBT, and increasing control of women. Those three elements you'll find in almost every rising authoritarianism, authoritarian government, and usually it's quoting or relying on religion to do that. Are you putting anti-Semitism as one of the red flags or not as much? Anti-Semitism functions a little differently than those three things, uh, but anti-Semitism exists in all, as, in all of them. Um, I want to switch to just um, deception for a minute in this family. And the reason that anti-Semitism functions differently, it's not always rooted in religion. Mm. The three things that I just mentioned, religion is used to justify, to justify it. In terms of the inheritance of deception, or the, the, the legacy of deception, we have Jacob tricking his father Isaac. And Jacob is Joseph's father. We have Joseph's brothers then trick their dad and say, here's this coat with the blood on it. That's not the truth. And then later, you have Joseph tricking them. And it just feels to me sort of like a corrosive, corrosive inheritance that is maybe it's there for storytelling, but you know, I feel like we, we learn that everything in the Torah is there for a reason. What is this thread? I mean, even, I mean, we, we, we haven't even talked about then, you know, Rachel and Leah uh, tricking. Where, Just, where they came from, there's a lot of trickery in the families, in the families that preceded them. 
So just what's, what's operating in, in this family dynamic before we get to reconciliation? It seems part of the strife to me. Yeah, but are, are you surprised by that? Have you ever encountered anybody trying to deceive anybody? It happens all the time, right? And uh, especially when there's all this family dynamic about parental favoritism and uh, competitiveness. And we know that Joseph, his, he, he was destined to be great. He was destined to be greater than his brothers and the savior of the family. So, um, the, it, and he knew that. And he conveyed that uh, to his uh, brothers. So, um, you can understand their hostility. And then um, their effort to deceive their father about what they did to Joseph. Because if they were to come back and tell him, well, you know, we killed him because you favored him and you gave him this coat of many colors, and uh, we don't like that. And in any case, we're the sons of uh, the other women, and uh, we know that you loved uh, his mother the most. Um, he wouldn't have uh, responded in a uh, positive way, or they were too cowardly to tell him or something. By the way, it's really interesting, and if you look at this in, in chapter 37, um, the blood that they cover the coat in, and they show the father, is, it's the same animal, a goat, goat, that Jacob used to deceive his father. If you remember, he put the goat skin on his arm. So the Bible is really big on measure for measure. And at the end of the day, the, 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 what, one message that's being conveyed here is human beings are not perfect. And what makes somebody great is that they overcome their imperfections and their flaws. And that, at the end of this story, is what happens. Both from the brothers' perspective, they, they say, in, actually in Genesis 42, the previous time that they came down to Egypt, um, they say, you know, all of this is happening to us because of what we did to our brother just like out of the blue. So they carry this guilt with them for years. And, and then years. Joseph deceives the brothers in the process, in the process of, of, of reconciliation. reconciliation. Right. It's, a, it's a family, it's a family, how shall we say? He doesn't reveal himself. Right, and he, and he deceives them with the, with the goblet, goblet, and yeah. he deceives them, first of all, absolutely with concealing himself, but then in giving them all these things to do under not honest uh, <laughs> conditions. So, but the key is both actors, both sets of actors overcome. The brothers overcome their guilt and their hostility, although not entirely. That's another part of the story. If you read it carefully, if we had six months together, right, you would see that there are little subtle hints, even after the family comes down to Egypt, that they never fully reconcile. But they do enough. Even on Jacob's deathbed, don't, aren't they Even, worried that they've been that's right. absolved? Yeah. That's right. They say to themselves, now that our father is dead, what will this guy do to us now? Um, and from Joseph's perspective, he overcomes as well. He overcomes his arrogance. He overcomes. And he, he, he weeps. And he acknowledges that don't blame yourselves. It wasn't you. Now I understand there was a greater plan here. So Sharon, in terms of reconciliation, we've got to get to that before we yeah. get to questions. Yeah. What should we take away from this story in terms of either the urgency of it, the belatedness of it? You know, does it take too long? Well, I think it's stuff that all of us know because we live in families that are screwed up, which is you got to keep trying. It often doesn't work. And sometimes it works, and it's not perfect. It's not... The, it's, this, is not a, this is not a, you know, a Disney movie. This is what happens in real families. And the effort to try and achieve some level of reconciliation remains a worthy and difficult task. And it is part of what it is to be a human being. And the story, and I agree with you very much, the power of these stories. Imagine you were creating holy texts that are the foundational texts of your people. Would you have screwed up family after screwed up family after screwed up family as the center story of your holy texts? 
I wouldn't. You know, I'd want us to look a lot better than these stories show us. But I think they're precisely there to remind, because all of our families are as screwed up. And I think it's about to remind, it's there to remind us exactly what you said. Imperfection, beyond just making small mistakes, we make big mistakes in life. We make big mistakes with the people we love the most. And yet we can keep trying to come to some places of reconciliation. But it's not like it goes back to some nirvana or some heavenly perfect state, you still carry the wounds. And in fact, all of these generations are carrying inter and multi-generational trauma, which we now understand absolutely impacts people. Abuse children who do not get the deep help they need grow up to be abusive adults. And we see this story repeating itself over and over again. And by giving it the larger meaning, which I believe that we are, have, do have destiny, but I'm not sure we know what it is in advance, but by giving it meaning and purpose, it helps us to, I think, forgive ourselves and find a way to be able to begin to maybe forgive others in our own families. And that's the hardest place to do this work. I mean, just if you can say a little more about what our tradition asks of us in terms of our families in particular. Do you think this is not the same kind of menu of atonement um, with your colleagues or your friends or even maybe your partners, but there's something about family where the work has to happen? Yeah, I mean, uh, Rabbi Kleinbaum sa said that at the very beginning. This is, this, th these narratives unfold from family to family. The, 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 um, the, the essential social entity from the biblical perspective is the family. And the family has to, e even when you see that, uh, you know, so, okay, so Abraham had uh, two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and Ishmael went this way, and the family, kind of the line split, but it continued through the, the, the designated uh, offspring um, generation after generation after generation. History unfolds through families. So to break the family is, in a sense, to break the narrative. Um, so we learn, ironically, maybe not so ironically, we learn that through these narratives of these troubled families that family is sacred and the relationship needs to be repaired. Now, if you add that to the aspect uh, that Judaism also considers central, atonement, where, of course, we have set aside in the calendars atonement, the work of atonement should be done every day, but we set aside 10 high holy days for that task of atonement, and it's personal atonement. It's starting the year with yourself. We, um, I think we understand one of the great urgings of Judaism, which is keep the family whole. Don't let it break, and if it breaks, try and repair it. And through the process of atonement, you end up repairing yourself as well. So finally, before we go to questions, Sharon, the fact that uh, Joseph puts his brothers through a kind of test, he doesn't just say, guys, it's me. Yeah. Is there something there that is, is, is he being obnoxious again? Or is there something else? I think it's is so deeply human. Isn't it so deeply human that his first impulse when he's reconnected to them is to exact some revenge? That's so human. He wants to punish them. He wants to be mean to them. And he thinks that's going to uh, cure him. Or he thinks he imagines that's going to be satisfying. And it, it's ultimately not. But I think, I think the story just reflects the beautiful arc of screwed up people. And I, I find a lot of comfort in that, uh, that this is our sacred text. And finally, when he starts to weep, he has to leave the room. And they, of course, don't under, realize he can understand what they're saying because they think he's Egyptian and doesn't speak their language. But of course, he does. And then he ultimately says to them that very simple and powerful line, Ani Yosef Achicha, I am Joseph, your brother. So the way he identifies himself is back in the family. 
um, and I find it so moving. But I think it's I think it's just very human to want. He wanted to punish them a little bit. Thank you both so much. All right, we're going to have a few questions because we're almost at time. And Ari will. This is Ari, everyone. Please don't be shy. There's got to be questions. Well, maybe yes. everybody here's families are not like mine, so they, they can't relate. <laughs> um, Rabbi Kleinbaum was my teacher on Zoom for two years during oh. COVID, <laughs> so thank you. Um, it's not really a question, but I, it, it dawned on me when you were talking. When you were talking about our religion and, and um, paganism, brief comment there. That in our pa- religion and what? Paganism. You know, in paganism, all the family fighting was among the gods. Uh-huh. I see. Uh-huh. But we have, quote unquote, a perfect god. He has no one to fight with. He's all by himself or herself or whatever. And so all of these relationships are, have to be among human beings. And that's a, it, very just like, that's a very interesting. That's a big difference. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. I've never thought about it like that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to just discuss this concept of uh, preordin- predestiny and all mm-hmm. that. The Torah makes it absolutely unequivocally clear that God has no idea what's going to happen after he's done creation. You can see it time and again. The seventh day, he looks at everything and says, not just good, but very good. And two pages later, he says, I'm going to wipe out everything that I've ever created because he doesn't know what's going to happen. Kind of impulsive, he, huh? He doesn't know <laughs> what's going to happen in the garden. He doesn't. So I think that that concept has to be eliminated, that God is doing all these things and we're all under a preordained. I think it's clear. And in fact, God says my favorite line, which is man is born with an inclination to evil. Oh. So he's setting up the whole scenario. What's your first name? Peter. Pierre. Does anybody want to respond? Well, I mean, uh, Peter and I have talked about this for 30 years now, right? 35 years. I hear this comment from you more, more than once. And, and what can I say? I, you either believe or you don't believe. Uh, so, but I suggest to you that in the, from a religious perspective, especially if you're looking at biblical texts, if you eliminate this concept of preordination, that is, God has a design for individuals, but in particular, in, from the biblical perspective, for this people. God has a purpose for this people, which is repeated over and over again in almost every verse of the Bible, is either expressly said or implicitly said. If you eliminate that, you eliminate a, uh, let me put it this way, Peter, a um, interesting literary dimension to these stories. And I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, this, this is a place that we might have some disagreement and that the text might be doing that to comfort us. But I, I find strength in trying to deal with the craziness, you know, not knowing that, or maybe I would say it a little differently, that if God has a plan, we really don't know what it is. And we just have to do the best we can. But I'm not sure I know what God's plan is, and I'm not sure the Bible knows what God's plan is, because I know, I, there's a, actually a very interesting book by a Jewish theologian, uh, David Blumenthal, who was for many years um, at Emory University, called God as the Abusive Parent. And he went through the Bible, and you know, you could kind of create a biography of God where God acts out of anger and impulsivity and, and say, okay, what kind of God is this? And I think it's because you know, human beings have written these stories and are trying to understand and relate to God. I think God is, whatever God is, and I, as I said, I'm, a, I'm very religiously inclined and I believe deeply in God, but I do not believe we know what God intends. And well, that, that, that's, not, that's not even a modern concept. That isn't it. None of the, none of the heroes of the Bible know what God intends until God reveals, or they learn it themselves. Like Joseph, who says, now I understand. 
after all these years. And that years. makes sense to me. That's what I mean, that we human beings, if we open ourselves up to this challenge to understand our lives as having meaning and purpose, and we usually do it better when we're older rather than when we're younger, and we look back and we can understand things, that I believe is God's presence in our lives. But not that we are just fulfilling that predetermination. Right. But maybe that's just semantics. But thank you for that. Yes. So thinking back to where we started in this program tonight um, with Rabbi Kleinbaum, um, looking at how Joseph, uh, would, how we would modernly call him genderqueer, um, but looking at ancient text for this. Can you take us further in the story? We stopped with that theory sort of early on, but if we look at the arc of his life, could you take us a little further? And well, that's that why I gave two examples of after he's in Egypt, where the, and the Midrash focuses on these, by the way, but comes up with different conclusions. The one where he resists Potiphar's wife's uh, ad advances or whatever, the seductions or, and, and the many in the traditional t commentaries talk about that as a sign of his great moral clarity. Well, maybe it wasn't such moral clarity, right? If, it, if he wasn't deeply sexually attracted, it wasn't so hard to say no. And the same thing with the girls, that midrash from, that I described, which is amazing, where the Egyptian girls, because he was so good looking, were throwing themselves at him, and he didn't even notice them. He didn't respond to them. So those are two examples of that. Um, but like with all stories, nothing's a perfect story, and that's what midrash does, right? And believe me, my making these, you know, drawing, trying to create this, paint this picture, is totally within Jewish midrashic tradition. I mean, think of the story about Abraham and uh, and uh, destroying the idols in his fa in 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 Terach's uh, we idol. We talked about it last night. Oh, you Shai did. Hill, yeah. That it destroys the idols and. Is that story in the Bible? No. I mean, but it is so deep in our understanding of Abraham, it's Midrash. They were trying to understand Abraham and his relationship and showing what a great monotheist he was. It's entirely a made up story. And that's a part of what Judaism does. This, I think, is taking some things in the text and playing with them, no question, and you can entirely reject it. But I think it's pretty fun and fascinating. And I think it is one way to understand a family dynamic and the way somebody in a family gets uh, rejected is sometimes around these issues of not conforming to masculinity or femininity. So, it's an, so, it's, so it brings something out that for a contemporary LGBTQ world, pretty interesting. Are there any others? One up here. I really learned a lot from the both of you this evening, so thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to suggest that the, the theme of the dreams that occur in, in the Joseph story is really important. Yes. Because, you know, as a 17-year-old, I mean, what does he know about dreams? Nothing, right? And yet, he presents them to his family and to his brothers, right? Which undoubtedly constellates some kind of jealousy, I would, I would imagine. Yeah. And then as he goes on, and then when he's, when he's imprisoned, it's the dreams that he tells to his fellow prisoner yes. that lead to his ultimate release. Mm -hmm. Because I can't remember what the, the other prisoner was, um, a baker, baker or a baker. A cupbearer. Yes. What's your name? Your first name? Karen. Karen. And then he, you know, that prisoner tells Pharaoh, and Pharaoh requests to yes. see Joseph. So and what's your question, Karen? You're basically saying that the dreams, we need to pay more attention to them. Yeah. I mean, I realize I'm not asking a question that I'm making more of a comment, but I, I'm just suggesting yeah. that um, it's, it's something, to f something to focus on. And yeah. that, and that it's clearly the talent that Joseph brings to the world that, and by the, w what you described, the dreams of his adolescence, but again, at that time, 17 was, you were, should have been married with kids by 17, right? But the dreams of adolescence told in arrogant and obnoxious ways, quite different than the dreams of when he's already more mature right. and then get used uh, in very, very powerful ways to save people. So really, they're quite, they're, they're, you can see an arc with the dreams, absolutely.
And also, and, I'm sorry, and just to say that I think that Joseph considers his dreams a gift from God. Absolutely. His, his ability to interpret. Like one could see any talent, right? And this, is, this turns out to be Joseph's great gift to the world that God has given Joseph and uses it quite differently, whether he's an obnoxious adolescent or a more mature, thoughtful human being. Do you see him, just I guess as a final question, as someone that in our tradition we're supposed to aspire to be like? So, you know, that's a really interesting question. He's not included in the patriarchs, right? And the Talmud talks about that. He doesn't have a tribe. The tribe is uh, from his two sons. So um, ultimately, yes, but with caution, I think. I think the heroes from the book of Genesis are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and that Joseph is the vehicle to execute the divine will to get to Moses. I tend to like the minor characters, so to speak, and I think there's a lot to learn from them. And absolutely right that he's not con considered in that pantheon, but I do think there's a lot, because it's so human, this arc that he has from this arrogant adolescent to becoming, he could have just died then, right? But he becomes a person who saves humanity and and is a thoughtful, uh, I, and that he goes from being hate, arrogant towards his siblings to hating them, to wishing them ill, to going through an emotional, very deeply emotional response to them, and then saying, Ani Yosef Achicha, I'm Joseph, your brother. I find that, and how is my father? To go from not caring about what his, he, as he could have sent an army to go pick his father up and bring him down to Egypt and put him in a nice house. But he was clearly not willing to do that. But how many people, that arc, I think that's something to aspire to. Even though I agree the tradition doesn't put him in the same role, I'm, I admire him a lot. And I think the number, and like any great literature, and any great character in a literature, he goes through more personal transformations than, and maybe it's because we have so much information about his story, but I'm, I'm a big admirer of his, and I love the transformations he goes through and the place he ends up in his life. Um, still not perfect, but transformed. Thank you both so much. Thank you, everyone.